here at UVA, and I am so thrilled and overjoyed to welcome you to this master class with Ruby Sales. I want to start today by thanking the many people that have funded this event and organized it, most importantly the Virginia Foundation for the Humanities, the Office of the Executive Vice President and Provost at the University of Virginia. There's also been additional support from the Black Student Alliance at UVA, the Carter G. Woodson Institute for African American and African Studies, the Jefferson School African American Heritage Center, the Office of the Vice President and Chief Officer of Diversity and Equity, and the Project on Lived Theology at the University of Virginia. It is my delight to introduce to you Ruby Nell Sales. If I was to tell you everything that this amazing woman has done, we would be here all afternoon, so I'm going to keep it a bit short. But what I want to stress is the ways in which Ruby Sales looks at her work as a calling rather than a career. Her work is a calling rather than a career. She answered the call to social justice as a teenager at Tuskegee Institute, where she joined the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and worked on voter registration in Lowndes County, Alabama. Sales received a BA degree from Manhattanville College and attended graduate school at Princeton University. She received a Master's of Divinity degree from the Episcopal Divinity School. While there, she developed a reputation as a preacher and has preached at churches and cathedrals around the nation. After Divinity School, she founded and still directs the national nonprofit organization, The Spirit House Project. As a social justice activist, Sales' work is cited in many books, journal articles, and films. She's received numerous awards and honors. An oral history of Sales is housed at the Library of Congress and she was selected as one of the 50 African Americans from the Civil Rights Movement to be spotlighted at the new Smithsonian Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, DC. Sales has made the struggle for racial justice one of the centerpieces of her work through the Spirit House Project. Since 2007, she's worked to expose the state-sanctioned deaths of African Americans by white police, security guards, and vigilantes by compiling a national database on these events, offering spiritual, financial, and organizational support to families, and by exposing these activities through church and community meetings, forums, and press conferences around the nation. In March 2016, Sales and Spirit House Project organized a National Day of Action in Washington, D.C., entitled Stop the War on Our Children during which women from around the nation gathered to acknowledge young victims of state-sanctioned violence. A report from the womb to the tomb, the history of police violence against African Americans is forthcoming. Recognizing a need to nurture the hope that resides in young people, as well as to revive an intergenerational community, the Spirit House Project introduced Hope Zones in 2016. Hope Zones are alternative learning spaces which offer diverse communities an opportunity to work toward the common goal of advancing democracy and nonviolence. Sales continues to preach and to teach all around the United States. And today she's here to talk to us about intergenerational strategies and building community with Wes Gobar, who is a fourth year here at UVA in the College of Arts and Sciences. He's a double major in history and government, and he is president of the Black Student Alliance. He grew up in Fredericksburg, Virginia, and I'm gonna turn this over to Wes to begin the conversation. So thank you again for uh, pulling us all together for this event, and thank you again, Ruby, for speaking with us. Um, I, the first question I'd like to ask is uh, wh where do you uh, see, or just to open up the dialogue with is, is, is where do you see yourself on a spectrum of a tradition of black activism uh, as, as it currently stands now and uh, how can we better work to, to bring together this intergenerational uh, work uh, struggle thank you Wes I'd also like to offer a few thanks myself I'd like to thank Maggie Guggenheim for her active work to bring me here to be a part of this conversation, the Virginia Council on the Humanities, as well as all of the partners whose hard work 
brought this day into being. It is indeed a Kairos moment for us to come together in this great academy to deepen our thinking about the critical issues of today. It is our responsibility not to seek glib answers, but to nuance our thinking and to put our eyeballs straight into the direction of history and to speak truth, not to accommodate our sensibilities, but for our, our liberation as individuals and as a collectivity. Okay. Um, I think that I place, first of all, I'm a Southerner. I was born in the South. I grew up during segregation. I grew up in a society that although we claim to have, have been a part of a democracy, the very nature of apartheid is in some ways fascist. So it was a society that demanded conformity. It was a society that maintained itself through state terrorism and state-sanctioned rape of African-American women that went all the way back, and girls that went all the way back to enslavement. It was a society that, that used Christianity, empire Christianity, to justify empire and all of its tributaries of injustice and violence. At the same time, I was a part of a counterculture that black people created to resist as a, as a resistance to the, to the predatory nature of Empire Southern culture. And in this counterculture, black people offered a moral and a political exit, moral and political exits out of the social and political and spiritual malformation of Southern society. So whenever I think about my place in this trajectory, I see myself following that tradition of offering moral and political and spiritual exits out of a society that's contaminated and polluted with injustice. And I also see myself as being a part of a community that even in the most desperate moments, we were able to imagine a hopeful path forward that not only redeemed us out of the morass of injustice, but also offered a clearing for white people to see a pathway straight to the kingdom of God. And so I, I, that's where I root first and foremost. I also, let me just say that I also think that within this context of black struggle, the most pervasive cry for black people has been black lives matter. Whether we're talking about black people held in captivity in sites of terror called plantations, contained under constant surveillance, imprisoned in these sites of terror, made to work for free labor, no matter how you look at it, black people have always asserted that black lives matter. Even in the, and, and they saw themselves, despite all of the contradictions inherent in Jeffersonian democracy, they saw themselves as being legitimate inheritors of democracy and the benefits of democracy. And they brought this sense of justice and black folk theology to the whole enterprise of what it means to, to be a black person struggling in America. So I, I position myself within that long trajectory. And I, I think that's uh, the sort of... And what about you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I think this positioning of ourselves as 
a moral voice as a counterculture is, is trying to get um, the, this country and our institutions to live up to our ideals is something that very, very much fits in with the history of activism at the University of Virginia, um, whether that's pushing uh, to divest from apartheid or to, for a living wage for, for workers um, at the university, which UVA still underpays as contract workers, most of whom are, are, are African American. Um, and whether that's, I, I think throughout the history of the university, you've seen activism, specifically black activism, has always been the moral compass of uh, the university. And uh, I, I, so I, I, I very much identify with this. And uh, I could, I, I also, I mean, I, I think the younger generation, my generation specifically, uh, I think has been, there's something special about it um, in terms of how this renewed, I, I think, sense of activism. And because I think when I was younger, my dad would always sort of say, oh, well, you know, people don't protest anymore. The, the, the young, the, we, this generation has just kind of changed. Uh, my generation, you know, they, they, they messed up. And as I got older, I, I learned about uh, Coento Pro and um, the, the sort of the, the methods that the government used to essentially abort a whole class of uh, black political leadership. And that you know, much more makes sense. And this generation, I think, uh, has a new opportunity to, uh, to, to restart that and to continue this, this sort of moral push um, for, for, for the US and for all of our institutions to, to, to um, live up to ideals and to stop killing us and for, for black lives to really matter in America. So I think those are two sort of areas where I position myself. Uh, but I'm still very much trying to find my place. And I uh, don't have an answer as eloquent as, as uh, the one you just gave. Well, let me ask you a couple of questions. <laughs> what do you think, if, when you look at the Southern Freedom Movement, which is commonly called the Civil Rights Movement, mm -hmm. but I don't call it civil rights because it was a larger movement, a larger push than for just civil rights. It was about human dignity. It was about stopping state-sanctioned murders. It was about the right to exist in a society as a full human being and not a second-class citizen. So it was a large, it was really a freedom movement, as Vincent Harding says. What do you think was done successfully in that movement? And what do you think can be improved uh, from that movement with your generation? I think one example is that um, the, 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 the Black Freedom Movement, uh, one of the successes is that it, it forced America to uh, see the moral um, depravity of its actions, whether that's through tel television and through the, the, the sheer brutality of what was going on. And I think that's a, a sim similarity with Black Lives Matter today, um, with social media, and now we have a much larger platform um, to, to, to do that. To, and it's, it's traumatizing to see, to see videos and to hear more about more of um, this brutality going on and on again, but I think it is effective in, in, in the same sort of moral sense of um, forcing people to reckon with that. May I ask you a question? You mentioned social media, then we'll get back. But I just wondered that when the movement took place, the black community was a more intimate community and functioning at its highest capacity. Given a series of social and political assaults on the black community, under the guise of desegregation and all other forms of fragmentation, do you think that, what are the challenges you feel in a society where black people have been fragmented and dispersed and scattered? Do you think that there's still the same possibility of building a cohesive movement as existed during the 60s, or do you think it's a different challenge? I think that the challenges are different, uh, but and and it's very much true that the the government has atomized, I think, um, black society in a lot of different ways. I also think our, my generation, in many ways, is more connected in some ways than others. I think it's more intersect. I mean, obviously, intersectionality is the sort of buzzword of activism today, but uh, the the movement as it has existed in the '60s, it's you know, black women had to wait for their turn, or it was, uh, you know, there, there's no movement for um, LGBT, LGBTQ people within uh, the, the movement. It's sort of focused on one ideal, and I, I think, and I could be wrong, I mean, but, but I do think that younger people are more aware and trying to be more inclusive in that aspect, so that's one way in which it's possibly more connected, but 
Um, I can't say that's a, that's some, that's an issue that I've given. I have, I have a really good answer to you. Um, well, I just want to say something that you're absolutely right about the movement not dealing with LGBTQ issues, mm -hmm. but I do think that in terms of women, it was a different story because black men were all profiled and no work. And black women did the hard work, and we took the leadership positions yeah. that we didn't get credit for. So I really do think that that has to be acknowledged. The black female leadership, take for example me, a 17-year-old black woman, girl, goes into Lowndes County, and immediately I'm put in charge of a county with a thousand people to register to vote and to basically their lives in my hands. And so that I think that we have to deeply nuance this whole assertion that black women and women were invisible in the movement. I, of course, there was patriarchy. And of course, black men took the microphone and wanted to assume it as their own. But black women, who historically have never been taken kindly to that kind of assertion, snatched the microphones away. And, and took over and took our leadership roles. Black women historically have never been passive. Yeah, and and I, I would definitely wouldn't I mean do with that in any way because I, I think I'm trying to say exactly what you said that the bulk of the work had been done um, by black women and it's uh, I'm especially I've, I've read this really good book Black Against Empire about the history of the Black Panther Party and just how much um, the leadership was take, was was black women and. Uh, that, so so I, I, I think that's really important. I also think um, every generation tends to idealize their own movements and compare it to other movements and, the, and weigh it by different, different scales and standards. Uh, so I don't know that we can say that the black community will never be as efficient as it was during the, uh, the, the 1960s, during the, 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 the black freedom struggle in the South. Uh, I hope that that is not the, the epitome um, and that there is more to come, but I definitely have a lot of faith in my generation as it stands now, and I, I, I think that um, I, 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 yeah. Do you think it's a generational question when we are in the midst of a, another process of dispersion mm -hmm. with the real estate industrial complex where black communities are being broken up across the nation, being further fragmented, the cities are being whitened, and black people are being pushed out into rural sites of desolation without jobs, without access to health care, without access to good education, um, viable education, I should say, and, and, and really being isolated from the instruments of technocracy because cities are the heartbeats of technology. And we live in a technological, a capitalist technocracy where black people are being isolated from the heartbeat of technocracy. I agree with you. I have ultimate hope and faith in your generation. I think the question that your generation must face is how do you raise up people from disposability to essentiality? in a 21st century technocracy when very few people matter and the more colored you are, the le less you matter. And the younger you are, the less you matter. And the older you are, the less you matter. How do you work all of that? Tell me what your thoughts are about all of that. I mean, because we must do something about gentrification. We must do something about the criminalization of Black Lives Matter. We must do something about the criminalization of fashion and your generation. We must do something about the predatory and insidious nature of a war on a youth culture that began all the way back in the, in the Southern Freedom Movement with the first assault on SNCC and then the Black Panthers. So, and now Black Lives Matter. So what do you think what resources do you think your generation bring to the table that can counter, that can offer a counter narrative alternative to the, to the forces that are being arrayed against us in this technological society? Right. One of the things that struck me um, when I was here on August 12th uh, at the, the, the counter protests is there were, there were people from Chicago, from New York, from uh, the West Coast, from all across the country. 
And they, I think my generation, uh, I mentioned social media earlier, but that's not the only sort of form of networks that we have. I think the activist culture is, is very healthy that we yeah. all support each other. And even it's not just, um, at, not just black struggles, but pe- for people, we support each other with our different movements, whether that's for a movement for uh, undocumented people, for LGBTQ, and, and people all came out um, to sort of support each other. And I think that although the um, there is a sort of there there is a push to 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 to, to separate and uh, isol- to, 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 to to isolate uh, black people from their roots from their communities, I think that uh, technology is democratized in such a way that we can still come together and and fight um, everything that you've talked about. I think one other difficulty is that um, the movement for Black Lives uh, has been so focused on police brutality is an issue. And as, as such, it kind of sucks all the air out of the room out of gentrification, uh, out of environmental racism. Um, because you know, as people were being displaced and, and pushed out of the cities, it's, they're also being put into, uh, th- those companies are also, um, are also ruining uh, the, the water and the air quality around, around them. Uh, so I think, I, I think it's, it's a difficulty in, uh, to, because the, this, this, the, the discourse has been so focused around state violence, and there's so many other insidious and violent aspects of the state that don't just that aren't just encompassed by the police. Um, so I think that's a, a challenge to sort of shift the conversation. And I know that the movement for Black Lives has a very great uh, list of policy suggestions that covers a lot of these things. It's just sort of getting these out here. I, I also I, and I think that one thing is that we need to, um, to, to, gr- to broaden awareness about what are the policy solutions about this and get people to specifically pressure all of our legis- legislators and specifically pressure people um, to do that. I think oftentimes we speak in generalities about these problems and we need to have a more clear sense of what the solutions are so that all of us can, be, can apply the correct amount of pressure. Um, and how might we, what processes that we might Put in place that would ins- guarantee us the pathway that you've just laid out. Have you thought? And how does that relate to the community? Where is the community in all of this? Mm-hmm. In other words, what I'm asking is as a young black person, mm-hmm. What is your connection to the, to the collective black community? And how do you see struggle vis-a-vis your place in that community? Or do you see yourself as standing outside of the community, waging a struggle on behalf of the community when the community is not present in the struggle? Uh, I see myself, Ethan, I, I, so I think c- coming to UVA, my strongest uh, connection has been with black students, and I would say that growing up, um, I, I grew up in a background where I, I felt I was very separated and I, I think isolated mm-hmm. from my own culture, and I think it's been a process for me to sort of grow into that, but I think part of the challenge here is, is uh, I, what I think the conception of community needs to expand it out to Charlottesville community, because they're dealing with everything you just talked about with uh, with. The, the, the crisis, the, the 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 city trying to push them out of uh, out of housing, and uh, with if, if, with, uh, with 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 wages. So I think all of our struggles are connected, and I think the community I, I see is that um, I feel connected to the to the student community at UVA, and I think I needed to do more. Um, I think we all need to do more to connect with uh, the Charlottesville, and so that that's not a um, so that we don't stand alone, because that diminishes our own power. Um, and I think sometimes I've found it easy to, to, to speak on behalf rather than within the community. And that's something that I, I struggle with as well, as, a, as I'm trying to go through my journey with. with uh, yeah, I ask that question because I think that one of the very unfair acts against your generation was to put you in all white settings that unhinged you from the continuity of your community and put you in environments that were often hostile, dehumanizing, and non-reaffirming, and in many ways decimated the intimacy that is not only necessary for movement building, 
but to give you a clear picture of who you are. So older and younger black folk are faced with the challenge of getting to know each other again. And the question is, how do we do that when there has been a great deal of intergenerational hurt and misunderstanding? How do we become a whole community again, um, operating from a common goal? And it doesn't mean, when you say a common goal, it doesn't mean that everybody thinks that we need to reach that goal in the same way. But what it means is that we agree that we're headed in a certain direction and this is our destination. And I think that your generation, in many ways, are victims of bad decisions that our community made in the sense that if you have fought against a predatory empire that is violent by nature, that is dehumanizing, that you're trying to change with the movement, why would you then turn your children over to those very people to be taught without any protection? So I think that your you I think that it's it's a very complicated, painful reality to be a young person, period, in the society, and the most particularly to be a young black person who've existed in communities out there, as Toni Morrison says, where people don't love you. And so the great challenge is, how do we walk across that bridge together to become, to deal with fragmentation? And how is it that we know each other again? That to me is as necessary as contesting white supremacy, is to rebuild ourselves. I think you really hit the nail on the head. The, the process of integration was very intentional and insidious in um, all the ways you just described. My, like, my brother, for instance, uh, was put on... I, I went through, to a school that was slightly... I, I would say like a bit more diverse than UVA, but it was very segmented in the sense that um, all um, white students took AP or honors courses. My, my brother was put on the sort of this path of he's a bad kid, he's this and continually put through the sort of school to prison pipeline of suspensions. Mm -hmm. And he almost, I mean, I think he, he was, they, 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 and he was also put in alternative school. Um, and, and God, and he really found God and he was able to get out of that. But I think it's, it's very intentional in the ways that um, they funnel people through, you're put through a path. And I was also, when I was young, a child, I was put through, uh, I was put into special ed. And, and I think there's a, a history of African, African American students being put into special ed programs when they don't need to be, they just have, they're just being children, and because they're black, obviously they're uh, seen as a different, in a different way. Um, so this, the, 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 the school system is very insidious about the ways that it separates and sorts people out. Um, and it's also a challenge because uh, our, our schools, um, no matter what, will never have the same amount of resources. And I, so my dad went to Southern University, and I visited there now, uh, I visited there this summer, and uh, the, the Louis state of Louisiana just cut so much funding. I mean, if you go from Southern University to LSU, where they have the state-of-the-art campus, it's not even close. Um, and it, it very intentional by Bo the, the governor, Bobby General, to, 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 to cut out uh, the fund, all the funding for HBCUs. Um, and uh, obviously, I think African-American professors at universities have less, at, at PWIs have less academic freedom to actually say and do what they want. Um, and, and it, it, so how do, we, how do we cross that bridge and how do we talk to each other? I think one thing, I, I also, I'm going to go back to August 12th, is that I, I found um, young people were there who cared about contesting white supremacy and old people were there who, you know, cared about the community and who cared about, uh, who, you know, you know they, they, I think that they, we kind of came at it from different angles and we were sort of very much... Um, focus on white supremacy and angry, and then and old people who had lived in the community for a very long time. I saw many older people, this, this NAACP, whether it's housing associations or Black Lives Matter, kind of came together in this moment. So I hope that it doesn't take crisis for us to come together, but I think that's one great example that I did see uh, in the moment. Uh, and then I, I think we'll continue, I, I'm, I'm hoping we'll continue uh, throughout the year, um, hasn't necessarily been consistent, but 
I think crisis does bring people together. Um, and I think we are in a moment of crisis uh, right now. Well, I, I, I think that let's just deepen our conversation about this chasm between younger folk and older folk. I think that it's really a normal situation for there to be some generational uh, disagreement and dissent. Because I think it's important that the younger generation pushes the older generation who can become ossified in the status quo. And I think it's important for the young, older generation, because I know that when I was a younger person, I was pretty arrogant. And, and I thought I knew everything and what I knew could be put in a thimble. And I look back and I'm embarrassed because I thought that SNCC was the first and only movement that had ever existed in American history. And I thought everything started and ended there. So I think that I want young people to push. I want young people to ask the hard questions. And I want them in many ways to be non-compromising because I think that's very important. But at the same time, we have to look at the systemic ways in which that natural guff between young and old has been intensified between younger and older black people. And how is it that we began to just put it out there? And how is it that you began to name your hurts? And how is it that you be very honest that in many ways, having gone to white schools, you feel more intimate with white people than you do with your own people? Let's just put it out there. And let's try to figure out, how do we deal with this? What is it that the older generation can offer? And how might you speak in tongues in ways that we began to understand without a self-righteous indictment about all these young people? How can you call us to an honesty that makes us look at what did it mean to fight in a movement only to send your children back into the empire? And so we've got to really, really, really take the opportunity mm -hmm. to address these issues. And also, I think that every generation is called upon to deal with its own contradictions. And so what are your contradictions? And I think that one of the things that I would ask you is how do you define leadership? Does leadership come from getting a college degree? Or are authentic leaders called up out of the body of the people? Because you know the people and the people know you. What is your, are you preparing yourself to be a part of a black elite who look at your people through contemptible eyes as if they're strangers? Or are you preparing yourself to be a part of a community project and a larger project of democracy. And if so, we, we need to begin to interrogate our language because when we use words like diversity, diversify, that's a, an assumption that someone owns the table and that they have the right to expand the table. When in a democracy, it's all of our tables. So the word is not diversify, it's democratize. And so how do we begin to your generation, I need you to come up with a new freedom language because the language that we once used has been stolen by the right wing and they use these, this free, uh, language of liberal democracy to hide very insidious non-democratic ideals and even fascist ideals. Mm -hmm. So how do, what do you think about what is the task of your generation to take this struggle a little bit further? I think... The, How might you do that as right. well? Um, I, I think this is something that... that you, language and people are always uh, co-opted uh, in America. And I, I think that even you go back to immediately during Reconstruction and people are talking about, well, my rights are being infringed upon and sort of thing. And I, I think... Uh, with with you, you mentioned sort of black elite, we, we saw that um, many many African Americans were go into political positions. They go and become mayors, and they become uh, congressmen, and they vote or they pass um, many of the same policies that imprison uh, and and inflict violence upon uh, 
and uh, African Americans and then at the gentrifier neighborhoods. Um, and at UVA, I think there's still that, that the, the university does try to co-opt uh, leaders and leadership uh, at, 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 at here and, and to sort of their own um, power structure and to playing. The UVA is a very, I think, elitist uh, institution with, we, we found ourselves in student self-governance and it's sort of, uh, it's sort of, it, it, it's, it, they, it, it's cloaked in language of democracy, but it's very, still very elitist and I think um, they do try to sort of incorporate um, black leaders into that. And I think that's always a struggle between co-option and trying to have um, a voice as well, but then, um, and, 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 but then also staying genuine and also being um, within the community. So I think that, that's always a, a real struggle. Um, and I think it's, I think it's just, all, I, 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 don't, I, I don't know if there's a silver bullet or a good answer. I think it's just always trying to stay grounded and have roots. Um, just having regular ways of reminding yourself who you are, regular ways of connecting um, with the people that are important, connecting, just connecting, I mean, I think, I think, it's, I think it's just making sure you're, you're conscious about who you're surrounding yourself with on a regular basis. Um, I think it's, it's okay to be in the room and at the table sometimes, but you have to have your roots and you have to make sure that you're continuing to, to stay, uh, to, um, to, be, to, to be genuine, but it's, 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 it's always in a struggle. Uh, so in, you're in, saying it's an individual struggle? I, I'm not... And not a class struggle? No, 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 no. I, you just asked me, okay. so I, I was just saying what I, I thought about in terms of leadership uh, for... Um, but I think that you're right in that um, s sometimes it can be easy to individualize it. And it, is, it is a class struggle. Um, and, it, and I think my language does uh, need to more reflect that. So. We're full of contradictions. I am too. Yeah. So <laughs> um, I want to ask the audience, how many of you have heard of race men and race women? Black people as race men and race women. Well, I'm a part of a generation, I think this answers the question, where our, it's not, the, class has always been in the black community, but the difference is, is that there was a connection between our career, careers, and the needs of the community. That we saw ourselves as being inextricably linked to the community project of freedom and, and community upbuilding. And we were intimately in the community because segregation made us be there. And so that we did not look at the black community as something out there, but it was a part of us and in us. Today, when, when there's this detachment that we've talked about, this historical rupture of, of, of continuity, elites tend to have, black elites, what I've noticed, tend to have more of a commitment to the American project than they do to the project of black upbuilding. And there's a certain degree, for example, there should never have been the devastating consequences that, that happened in the prison industrial complex. We should have had enough black intellectuals who could decode the meaning of that assault in language that people could understand so that generations of African American young people and older people would not be victims, but instead the lang black intellectuals did not do that. They did not explain to, to the community what was going on, what were the assaults, what was the criminalization of young people about, why was the what was the connection between the criminalization of black people in public housing and the criminalization of young black people. The, instead, there was great silence. What is the responsibility of black intellectuals to be able to help the community understand and define more clearly the meaning of the journey? If you do, do not do that, then whose cause are you serving? 
We should ne we, we had had more PhDs at that era as a community than we had ever had. Where was the public discourse? Where was the public debate? Who was really decoding the meaning of that? Who was telling the community, why were we allowing, if you do the crime, you do the time? Now, we see that today with the opioid crisis, people are having a more meaningful and a more humane conversation about addiction as a disease and not as a social pathology. And so that something began to happen with that connection between the community project and the role of black intellectuals in the 1970s as, as the segregation began to strangle the collective impulse of, of black people. Is that a question for me? No, I, I'm waiting on you to comment about that. I said a mouthful, so I'm waiting not, not to get choked. Sorry? No, it's an old expression. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of these old folks' expressions. Don't worry about it. So what do you think? What, in other words, what is the role? You're here, you're mm -hmm. studying history, and you're studying government. What is your, and, and first of all, let me just say I'm a black elite too, mm -hmm. because I have access to things that most black people do not have access to. I've, I've enjoyed certain benefits that most, even white Ameri most poor white Americans do not enjoy access to. So I'm not putting down the fact that people have benefits, what I'm really asking is what should be the relationship between your place in the world and the needs of the black community, and what should be the role of the black intellectual, and what should be the role of the black elite? Yeah. Um, well, one, one thing is, I think W. B. Du Bois's idea of the talented tenth is always maligned and seen as a elitist thing, but people always forget like the next sentence, which is that the role is to uplift the rest of the race. And I think that's just the simplest answer, and I think it's, it's true that, that the role of the black elite, uh, as you said, is to communicate exactly what um, these, like what, what uh, the most violent aspects of America are and, and mobilize, us, mobilize us to fight against us, to uplift the community, provide a shared sense of community, and to, to I think, um, simplify and uh, democratize some of these more intellectual concepts um, I think people were writing about mass incarceration and people were writing about uh, criminalization of the black male um, during the, the 70s and 80s and I, I mean and the 90s and Angela Davis or Cornel West and I, I, I think uh, Eldridge Cleaver but the, the problem is that I, I, there, the, you're right there wasn't a connection between um, some, some, some of these things so I, 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 that, that is the responsibility is to, to, to uplift and to make sure that I think everyone is working from that common basis of understanding and to mobilize. But movements and community upbuilding require us to write in language and symbols that the ordinary people, person can understand and utilize as a way of developing a narrative about who they are and the meaning of their lives and the place of their lives in American society. So if, if you talk in a language, see that's the dilemma that being in, in academia requires a certain kind of discourse that where the language is inaccessible to ordinary people and academicians end up talking to each other rather than the larger society. And so how do we bridge, how do, how do, that's fine if you're a white academician because the whole world exists for you. Mm -hmm. But when you're an academician of color or a person of color, we, we, our, our investment in the education of our young people which was an investment that began in 1865 when black men met in Selma to pledge their utmost endeavor to educate our youth for the advancement of the race and for the preservation of our rights and liberties. That became the community project for more than 100 years. And there was a correlation between education and the liberation and the upbuilding of the black community. And so I think that it's really important for us to see even intellectual discourse as being functional. Mm -hmm. And I think another thing is that we shouldn't see this gap as something new or ahistorical. 
um, because I'm, I'm thinking, like one good example was uh, New Orleans and the state of Louisiana where you had this class of mulattoes or people of color who either owned slaves or took part in the caste system and were encouraged um, to take pride in that. And I think that's, we should, like, this co-option, this, this, uh, this, this, this manufacturing of gaps, something very intentional and something very American. Uh, and I think that the more we deepen that understanding and remain conscious of that, the more we can try to fight against it. I want to push back on that because although you had class and although you had a very small number of black people participating in the system of enslavement, the very nature of segregation required a very different way of entering into that process. And segregation meant that there was a certain intimacy that although you might have been upward mobile, that although you might have improved your economic status, you had a mama who probably couldn't read or write. Mm -hmm. And so one had to navigate those contradictions. Uh, and, and, and although you might have been making five times more than the neighbor who was a maid, you all lived in the same neighborhood. And so that there was a certain kind of intimacy that existed, and when you know each other, when you really know each other on an intimate level, in many ways, it's much harder to violate each other. I, I do think, I, I would say that, sec, I'm not sure if segregation looked the same in every single place. Uh, it looked well. the same, segregation um, is segregation. I, yeah, but. Legal I, I, segregation is legal segregation. Right. There are no nuances, you couldn't ride the bus, you couldn't, Segregation is Southern apartheid. Now, whether or not you enjoyed a few benefits from the master's table does not, mit does not undo legal segregation. Mm -hmm. Throughout the South, there was legal Jim Crow. And New Orleans was one of the worst places. There's a book that you should read about black girls in New Orleans who grew up during segregation. It was one of the most racist communities. New Orleans was also the site of a massacre of a black community over the black men voting in the late 1800s. So I'm saying to you that no matter, that the pernicious nature and how white supremacy presents itself is consistent. And you, while you might have an exception to the rule every now and then, the center holds. I, I'm, I'm willing not to cut this sure. But so can he, he can he just have his little to say give so? A closing thought and then I think we should take some questions from people who come here. No, I'm going to yield my time to to to, to Wes. <laughs> Wes, let's have it. Oh, uh, I, I mean, I, I think, in, but in, in response, at least, I just wanted to posit that co-option is, you know, a function of that violent and pernicious white supremacy, and I do, and. Uh, I, I'm, I'd love to talk a little bit more about Louisiana because I'm, I'm working on this history of, of race riots and of massacres. So you uh, know about that massacre in New Orleans? Yes, I mean, there were, there were several. And Colfax, Orleans. Louisiana. Colfax, I'm, I'm yes. studying Thibodeau right now. But, okay. uh, it's the, 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 the violence in the service of uh, political and economic white supremacy is one seat. Uh, I, I, just, I, I think that is great that we can have this dialogue, and uh, I think... I, what I'm missing in this conversation is sort of the, the baby boomers, right, and the, 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 the middle generation. So I think we need to talk about how do we, what do we do about that piece. But um, I'd love to open up to the, to the, to the audience. Cause I, I'll I let you deal with that because the irony of it is, is that they're going to tell you you're not radical enough, and they're going to tell you all the mistakes that you made. That's the nature of generations. <laughs> This was a very active role here. <laughs> Y'all were really into it. Thank you so much for coming. I'm Kristen. Um, Hi, my, Kristen. Hello. Uh, my question is, so here we are at a predominantly white institution, for sure. And uh, we are a strong 6%, but there's still things that we can improve on. So my question was, what are ways in which that we can, how can we both infiltrate and 
reclaim spaces here on grounds while still staying tethered together as a community and keeping that collective identity strong? That's a very difficult question because the question is, how do you remain authentic within the inside? And so I won't be presumptuous enough to try to tell you but the ways in which you might do it, but may I offer a few suggestions? Is that I think that it's important to remember to create processes whereby you actively engage with the process of remembering American history from a black and brown and, 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 female, and female perspectives. And so that I think that keeps us grounded. I also think it's important to venture outside of the walls of community and to go and be a part of a larger project of resistance. I also think it's important to have, to read, and not Google, but to really read, um, <laughs> and, and, disc and, have, and to write. I challenge your generation to start publishing, to start writing, to do little magazines where you're writing and arguing with each other, pushing the envelope and, and dissenting and saying, oh no, that's not true. Do like we, I mean, we used to stay up all night debating issues. So I think that's another way of really holding your center by engaging in that kind of um, discussion. I also think it's important to be conscious of the trajectory that you're involved in and to ask what are your different names in this process? When I was a student at Tuskegee, I, I knew that my name was Ruby, but I didn't know what that meant. And it was at Tuskegee that I came to understand what it meant to be black. And then I also came to understand what my name, my middle name was woman. And then finally I got a last name and that last name was same gender loving woman. And so I think that we have to constantly be involved in our own self-critique, even as we critique the society. Thank you. Uh, first, thank you so much for being here. It's incredible to just hear you speak. Uh, my name is Rada. Um, so my question is, like, it's a little convoluted in that you know, you mentioned how you, you said you mentioned how we, you know, our, our communities have put us within the empire. We have found ourselves in predominantly white spaces, um, trying to stick with our communities while also, you know, becoming intimate with people who might not, you know, want what's best for us essentially. And my question is, how, for example, at UVA, how do we function in an institution that, in my opinion, a lot might disagree with this, but in my opinion, for all intents and purposes, functions as a white, you know, a white supremacist institution where we exist and we have our professors and we have our intellectuals and we have incredible speakers who come and speak to us, but in the end, we don't, we are, I, I think that we are second class citizens. I think that we are, you know, convinced, they try to convince us that we're not. I think that we get one or two seats at a table that doesn't belong to us. I think that we are trying to constantly you know, convince ourselves and remind ourselves that we have a right to be here. But ultimately, when it comes down to it, when it comes to our rights, when it comes to our safety and our spaces, it's not, it's not a place where, I don't, I don't think it's a place where black people can thrive. But the fact is, like, a lot of us are here and we're getting an education and we're trying to uplift ourselves and our communities, but, and, and how do we do that without, quote unquote, like, you know, they tell us not to bite the hand that feeds us, but, and, and, we, we, and we, you know, push back against that while also allowing that to apply because we want to remain students here, because we yes. want to remain benefited, we want to continue benefiting yes. from this institution. Yes. I think you do what every group of people who've done, who've had to resist, you build a counterculture within the larger culture of the community. So what is the counterculture that you're building here? And how might that look? And you can always build counter-radical spaces, even within an empire culture. And how do you build and how do you sustain that culture? And so, and where do you place your energies? And so that I would suggest that you begin to imagine, I'm not saying bring down the house, but I am saying building a counterculture. And that's exciting because everyone benefits from that. 
everyone gets expanded by a counterculture. So what resources do you have as young people in this community, and what faculty resources that you have that you can draw on in order to fashion and build this counterculture that becomes a pathway towards liberation? Because liberation is a dynamic process. It, it just doesn't happen in a moment. It's carefully curated and carried out over years. And so while you're here, you're here. But that doesn't mean you've got to really be here without having alternatives. Does that make sense? Do you know what a counterculture is? It's an alternative space. It counters the official way of being. It radicalizes the space. It creates even its own way of presenting and, and, and representing itself. And so uh, it, create, it has its own energy. And so instead of conforming, I mean, I won't suggest how you might do that because I don't want people to say, I'm coming here creating trouble. But I do think that you should come together as a group of young folk and really study other youth cultures and see how they have created alternative spaces within empire culture and how might you begin to use the arts as ways of creating a counterculture. Art is very important as a means of folk and youth expression. And how might you revitalize the youth music culture to be life-affirming rather than deaf driven and so that if you were to do spoken word, how might your spoken word be similar to Bob Dylan's song when he said the times they are changing? That's a counterculture. Um, I'm Kiara. I could listen Hi. to you talk all day. But um, my question is more so going back to this idea of the generational gap that you both touched on because my grandmother's 87, and so I've noticed that for her, the need to be conscious was a necessity because segregation was visible. Like, not being able to ride the bus was tangible, while today we more so, as you said, we need to change the language so that the things that are now invisible due to how people use rhetoric. Can you say war on drugs to make it seem like it's beneficial for people when really you're attacking a certain group of people? How do we fight complacency and apathy in a time when people are woke or conscious for the moment? Fight the trendiness of the movement. See, I don't think that people are really woke when people say Donald Trump is an aberration when they focus solely on Donald Trump, and when they say that he's normalizing white supremacy, white supremacy has always been normalized. That's been the normal co course of life in this country, or that he's normalizing misogyny. Misogyny has always been normalized in a white patriarchy. And heterosexism has always been normalized in a white male heterosexist society, and so that and, and I think that the signs are very obvious. When Jeff Sessions stands on television and criminalizes a whole generation of, of black people, and when Chicago becomes a manifestation of barbarians tearing down the gate of Western civilization, then that's obvious. That's not subtle. It's different, but it's, it's not subtle. And so we've got to stop saying that we live in a society where the signs of white supremacy are subtle. They're not. And neither are they microaggression, aggressive, because micro means small. They're pernicious, and they are systemically large, and we're going to be dealing with them for the next 100 years. Thank you. Um, Did that answer your question? Hi, um, I'm Eric. I just want to say thank you as well for coming out Hi. here. Um, so my question is... Where are you um, from? I'm from North Carolina. Okay, you know, all right. It's an accent. <laughs> um, 
So I was raised in a church. I still am active in my church. And as a black queer person, um, I have my own critiques about the church. But uh, they're still very, uh, I still honor the church as a space that cultivated a culture that was, um, that held uh, communion to a high regard of people. So my first question is, what was it like growing up in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, you know, with uh, what was the church like back then, and how did it help um, you develop to the person you are, and what do you, where do you see the church now as a place of, uh, it's like, it's, it's changed, basically. Um, how do you see the church in this present day uh, helping the community uh, progress? Well, I think that without romanticizing the black church, because first of all, I disagree that the black church was the most important institution in the black community. I think it was important, but I think black schools were more important because black young people were there all day and and had more intimate interaction with teachers. And I think because the preponderance of the teachers were women, the significance of of black uh, black public schooling has been reduced. And, and since men were preachers in the churches, the churches has, have taken, over, taken a larger significance than what I really think it was. So having said that, I do think that the black church for young people was a training ground. It was also a repository of black memory and black struggle. When we would sing songs, although you didn't understand the pure meaning of those songs, but they, they touched a historical chord that united even younger people with older people in the pews. And when black people would stand up and testify on Mother's Day about the significance of what black mothers had been for the freedom struggle and, and our place in that struggle, and when you would see grown men cry, you knew that it was more than just about black mothers that it was about a people who were a long way from home, from the motherland. And so that these things really captured your imagination. And when black people would stand up in the church and testify about being, that, they, that God provided a way out of no way, a, a shelter in a raging storm, a, 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 a captain of the ship, that, was, that became a part of your spiritual DNA although you, could, you began to only be able to decode it the, as you live life and experience life. So I think that the black church provided another important aspect of black life, and that was, I am somebody. I might be poor. I might be a victim of all kinds of humiliation and oppression. I am somebody. And ultimately, despite the fact that someone wants me to call them master, God is my master. That God is in charge of my sitting down and my getting up. And so when black people would pray, they would call God master in defiance of the pervasive narrative that required black people to honor white men as as the alpha and omega of their existence. That was essential to black people surviving with hope, resilience, without becoming broken winged birds and without internalizing our oppression and carrying the weight of anger. Because we knew that we couldn't get through this, this life called America filled up with anger. And so the black church had ways in which one could dispense of that anger while at the same time resisting. And I think what has happened to the black church today is that it has become, that the verification of one's significance is not that you are a child of God, but that you're a child of the empire and that you have money and things. And I think that that has been a deadly, deadly blow to a people who still stand outside the gates of prosperity in the American empire. I also think that the black church suffers from bad theology. If I hear another black person say, I'm here because I'm supposed to be, I'm gonna scream because that means that black folk were enslaved because they were supposed to be. 
and it's just bad theology. And so that I, I see, and as a young black person at church, I learned how to be the secretary of the Sunday school. I learned how to recite. I learned how to be able to engage in biblical arguments. It was a training ground, and it, it created, I mean, I remember sitting in church, and I would look at the black women in the uh, amen corner, and they seemed both mythological <laughs> and real. I mean, it was, but I felt deeply connected to them. I felt that with, as long as they sat in that amen corner, I was going to be all right, and I could be a child. I don't think young black children have that guarantee today. Thank you. Oh, let me just say something. In terms of the black church was, uh, every black church had practically had gay pianists and, 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 and men who were obviously gay. And the black church operated, it is a lie to say that what we see today is what has always been. That doesn't mean that black people did not internalize homophobia, but we were people whose backs were pushed up against the wall, and we needed all hands on deck. I have a question as, as well. I know today we've talked about the responsibility of, of you know, quote unquote, black elites and students, black students who, you can ask who are attending in the prestigious institutions like UVA, but what does what does an ideal ally look like in your in your opinion? I know that's that's a, a controversial word in some circles, but um, to you, Ruby, like what what would the prototype be in, in allyship? And I'll pose that question to you, Wes, as well. Like, say you had a, a, a white peer, a white friend, come to you and say, Wes, what do you want me to do? How would you answer that question? First of all, white supremacy, misogyny, heterosexism are systemic diseases that contaminate all of us. It diminishes all of our capacities to be fully human. So the first thing that I would say to the person who comes to me and asks me what do I want them to do for me is to point out for them to them that they do this for themselves and that it's for their own spiritual health in, in the face of, of systemic spiritual malformation. And I'm not looking for allies, because allies, I'm looking for companions. Who's willing to be a companion on this journey? Because there's something about being an ally that says that it's my struggle and not yours. And you're just standing in with me in a missionary kind of way without understanding that you're human, that you can't be socialized into white supremacy without being spiritual malformed, without it diminishing your relationship with God, each other, and all aspects of humanity. And so that I think that we've got to really begin to redefine how is it that we look at these systemic oppressions as, as spiritual malformation and social pathology. So my question would be, my, my response would be, how might we be companions on this journey that offers a pathway of redemption for both of us, and how is it that we might begin to be healed Tough together? Answer. Tough answer to follow. Um, I, I have three things that I think come to mind, which is one, uh, it's not enough to simply be non, you know, racist, obviously, or um, sexist or homophobic. Um, it, it, you have to obviously you have with. We are socialized, as, as Ruby said, into white supremacy, into all these harmful pathologies, and we have to take active action every day to combat that. Right. So if you're just sort of going about your life and saying, "Well, I'm not this. Uh, I'm not that," and but I, and like I care about the, and if you just think, okay, like intellectually you care about it, then you're not doing anything, and you're not actually fixing anything. And the other thing I would say is that, um, so you have to be anti, right? You have to be anti all these things. I think the other thing I'd say is that uh, white allies sometimes question, can I speak up about this? Can I say that? And I would rather have you speak out and be corrected than to not say anything at all, because in that, because if you just are thinking about it and, and don't say anything, that's the same thing as silence. And, and silence is complicity. Silence is, is, is perpetuating um, these systems. I think the last thing I would say is to, to recognize that um, you have power. I have power as a male. Um, a white person has, has power um, being white in a power structure. I have power being uh, cisgender. I have power being 
um, heterosexual. So I think, I think uh, recognizing your power and using that power to uplift those who, um, who, who don't have power, like using that power to, to tear down these systems is, is important. And recognizing how your power um, can, can impose upon others in, in, other, in, in all kinds of situations. Um, so those are the, the three sort of answers that I usually give uh, when people ask me that. Can I just say something very tenderly? I really want to say that it is really, really important to accept the devastating spiritual malformation and social pathology of white supremacy, misogyny, and all forms of systemic injustice. Let's look at white supremacy, for instance. It requires white people to commit suicide, to detach themselves from their ethnic roots, and to become some part of this monolith called white, which eradicates the reality of when they were outside of the gates of the empire, and that they were strangers as Italians, as Irish, as Jews. And so it creates a false consciousness where that memory is eradicated and suddenly you become one with an empire. And not only do you become one with the empire, but you eradicate the class assaults that happen in Europe. And suddenly you believe that no, the class doesn't exist. And so you are required to eradicate that part of your collective history that belonged to your great grandparents and to become one with the people who are not, that's not your history. And then it becomes a confusing nightmare where you kill yourself over and over and over again by voting for the interests of people whose interests are diametrically opposed to your, your interests. And so that, that's the kind of suicide. And it's also a suicide that keeps you ro locked into these very small spaces called white communities where you can't live on the land with other people, where you're constantly closing yourselves off. In very, that's, not, that's not a privilege. That's a spiritual death. So let's stop talking about this call to, to minimize white humanity as a privilege. And let's call it what it is. It's a call to psychic, spiritual, and social death. And, and so that the question is, are we honest enough? Are we courageous enough to want to live large, as young folks say? Or do we want to live into the smallness of whiteness? And for people of color who want to imitate that smallness, I want you to know that that does not come without great consequences to one's humanities. So I hope that we are thinking deeply about this whole question of the normalization of systemic oppression. And that when we do this work, that, our, that somehow we're doing it for other people instead of doing it for ourselves. Can I just count on you to begin to, to stop talking about white privilege? Yes, there are rights that white people have that black people don't have. But privilege, I have privilege that a poor white person in Appalachia does not have. And so obviously that's not the word that we should be using here. The word is rights. And as long as you think that this thing that you're given that's called whiteness is a privilege, who the heck wants to get rid of a privilege? But once you understand that it's a social and spiritual death and malformation and pathology, then all of us want to be whole once we understand. And, and it creates a certain degree of distance and anger towards people who would call us to our lowest rather than our highest self, and who would send our children to war to fight for their interests in the most cynical uh, ways imagined. And we would stop allowing our children to be foot soldiers. And that, appear, that also is black people who allow our children to go over to the Middle East and kill people and think that we can maintain the moral authority of our own 
uh, situation in this country where we're killing innocent people abroad. So this, this thing is really deep. Can I just count on you to really begin to think about it in deeper ways without being defensive? I, I, well, I just wanted to say, you, I love the, this formulation of spiritual and social death because there, we, in, in, I, I, in some of my classes we learned about this concept in the 1930s called social death. That, um, historians came up with it. Africans were completely separated from their culture upon coming here and that um, this sort of, this destroyed the family and this destroyed all of this, had this deleterious effect on Africa. And you're sort of flipping that and saying, here's the effects that, um, that, that white supremacy has on white people. Here's how it's erased their, their own culture, their own interests. And I, I just, I really... I really and their own humanity. Yeah, their own humanity. 